it's my pleasure to speak to everybody. I hope that you're having a good time here. And actually, when Alexander asked me what time I select to present, I've selected the time after lunch because I think that we will be more relaxed. But apparently, some of you are so relaxed that they did not reach the lecture. But anyway, so, uh, yeah, as Alexander absolutely correctly mentioned, now I work at uh, RBV Capital, it's a uh, venture capital fund, Russian one. And uh, uh, I'd like to give you kind of an overview of uh, how venture funding works overall, how you can uh, grow up your own startup company, how you can bring it to liquidity, everything about that. So I think that uh, I'll try to do it in uh, less than an hour. Anyway, I wanted to start with uh, actually my career path, and I think that it's something not very typical for a scientist or for anybody. So I talked uh, about it a little bit yesterday, and now I want to give you some kind of a different uh, perspective on the same. So I've started uh, like my scientific uh, track as a, an organic chemist, and it was like quite uh, a long while ago. So it was like uh, first, uh, second course of the university. And actually, I don't know why I decided to go for organic chemistry. Probably because my teacher was actually a very good uh, organic chemist, so I decided to uh, just do it. But after like working in an organic chemistry lab, after like a uh, couple of months maybe, I started to think in that, okay, so the final goal of organic chemistry is to, to synthesize uh, some molecule. It's like you are given a structure and you need to synthesize it as fast as you can, as efficient as you can, as cheap as you can, whatever. And that's your final goal as an organic chemist. But for me, the problem was that I wanted to understand why I should synthesize exactly this molecule, not something, some other molecule, why it should be like important. And at this stage, I've decided that, uh, well, a good way would probably be to like look into the structure of the proteins, look how the small molecules can bind to these proteins. And actually, at that point, I moved to computational chemistry. So I have started working in the lab, which was uh, doing some molecular modeling, molecular docking, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And it was uh, actually quite interesting. So, like, you can look into the structure of the protein. Uh, you can understand why you need to put a phenyl ring here, a metal group there, and then it probably will bind better. So it was my idea at that time. And actually, I would say that it was uh, quite interesting for many years. So I've been staying with this group, like, for seven years at least. But the next problem was that I wanted to go one more level up and to understand why the group should work with the, specifically this protein. And I think that you know that many academic groups just are uh, going on working with the same protein targets, with the same area for years. It's like, you know, you come into some lab, they say, okay, we are working with, uh, I don't know, adenosine receptor, a to a And we've been working with this receptor for like 20 years, and we do not care that it's not important anymore, we just move on and continue working with it. So it was uh, one of my first problems. That I did not understand why we should work with this target. And another big problem was that, uh, okay, if the final goal is to, not to model, but to create something like material, to create something for real life, then uh, there are many diseases that cannot be actually addressed by molecular modeling. So there are many targets that cannot be modeled. And I think that uh, you know quite well that, okay, it's okay to like model some protein small molecule inhibitors, but if you have no structure of your target, if you have like some kind of uh, loss of function diseases, anything, that's a lot of cases where this molecular modeling can not do much. And so that was like a point for me to make a second decision and to transit to kind of a startup company. And uh, this company is uh, actually... It was not only me, it was like the entire group that decided to move away a little bit from purely computational chemistry, from pure method development, to uh, some kind of drug discovery. And this was beautiful, indeed. Because when you are doing your own company, you have a complete freedom. You can select everything. You can select area where you will play, you can select a disease indication, market, whatever. So you understand the very high-level picture. And that's very good for you, really. It's really exciting when you can say that, okay, we'll do the drug for this disease because it's important, because nothing helps, because we can do and we'll try. But, of course, with this, like, uh, completely freedom to operate, you have a problem that you need to be very competitive. It's like, you cannot do just 100 plus 1 ligand of this receptor. No, it won't work. You need to do something really good in order to survive, in order to get funding, in order to exit, whatever, and that stuff. 
So later on, after being with a startup company for a while, I've decided that, okay, it's good to be at the startup company, but it's even better to be in a venture fund. And actually the thing is that, uh, you know, it's like when you are in a startup company, you have like one asset, one company, and uh, you put all your stakes into this company. And if it fails, you know, you fail. So that's good and bad at the same time. So it gives you like a very strong motivation to be successful, but at the same time it's high risk because if it fails, well, everything fails. But uh, with a venture capital fund, actually you do invest into several companies. Of course, you select them and then your risks are a little bit spread over this company at least. So basically that's it about how did I get there. And I think that's enough about me. And now we can move uh, to the, actually the topic that I wanted to bring today. It's about drug discovery and funding and uh, venture capital in this area. So <clears throat> actually drug development is a very interesting uh, process. I did my kind of homework and I've looked how many scientific papers were published and were cited, indexed in PubMed, Nature, etc. And it's more than 1 million papers indexed in PubMed for the only 2017, 1 million. That's quite a lot. And it's more than 2,000 papers in nature and more than 2,000 papers in science. That's quite a lot as well. So my question to you is, how do you think, how many drugs were approved, say, by FDA in 2017? What do you think? Yeah. Thousand? Hundreds? Yeah. Yeah. Fifty? Three? Thousand? Any other ideas? Zero. No. It's not that bad. <laughs> okay, so I would say that the person who said 50 is the most closer, most close to the real number. So the real number is 46 new drugs approved by FDA. 46. And 1 million publications. So what all these publications are about? <laughs> if it's only like 46 drugs. Well, of course, uh, some of them are like for me thoughts, I understand, but that's quite low. And in 2016, it was even twice less, it was 22 drugs. And that's a big problem, really. So now, how much it costs to develop a drug? It actually turns out that to develop a single drug, single pill, it takes $4 billion. That's massive. So if we think about our fund, our fund is $35 million. So it's like, how much? It's like 100 less than that number. And if we think about uh, how much is that, it's like 10 Airbus A380 jets. And it's five times the budget of uh, like a Russian uh, Yaroslav region. So it's a very huge number. And basically, of course, we, we don't understand that. One reason is that it's not cheap to like to buy mice, to do all the studies, to do experiments, etc. It's not cheap. Yeah. But the reason is that it's a very high rate of failure. It's like in order to bring one drug to the market, you need to like start developing thousand molecules. You need to go into phase one with hundreds of molecules, phase two like. It's like a funnel, and that's uh, actually very narrowing down funnel. So it's only it's only led to approval of 30, 46 new drugs. So that's quite costly, and that's quite risky. So that's the bottom line of this slide: that not all science turns into drug, and it takes a lot of money to make a final drug. So why pharma continues to do that? Why it's so excited about doing drugs because it's so expensive, so risky, and so problematic? So one apparent reason is that uh, despite all these problems with drug development, pharma is a very uh, profit, uh, profitable uh, area because uh, profit margins in pharma, so it's a little bit like small letters here, but anyway, I'll say that the most profitable industry in 2015 was health technology. And here is a profit margin, net margin. So it's more than 20%. It's more than for finance, more than for technology services, more than for electronics, etc. It's like a very uh, big profit margin. And the reason for that is because, you know, uh, pharma can uh, justify, can put almost any price tag on the drug if it's a regional drug. And that's uh, basically very beneficial for all pharma companies. The next thing is that, you know, the product that you are developing, it can become a blockbuster. And I think that you know what's a blockbuster drug. So blockbuster drug is a drug which has a sales of more than 1 billion. And actually, that's a lot of such drugs that has been approved by FDA and that has been developed at some point of time. So in 2014, it was like the one blockbuster drug is Humira. Do you know what is it? It's basically anti-TNF-alpha drug. And it has been, it's a biologic, I think it's the first anti-TNF-alpha drug approved and it has been used for treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. And it was like the first biologic for 
this indication and it has like 12 billion dollar sales and you know if you have 12 billion dollars a year then you can spend for billion to develop this molecule it's nice it's it's, it's still good then you see here it's Sovaldi. do you know what's Sovaldi? yeah it's it's like more interesting story because it's like a treatment for hepatitis c virus and it's a cure for hepatitis c virus the first one which hit the market hit the market and indeed uh, as far as i remember there were some debates regarding the pricing of this drug so fda really tried to object on the huge pricing of this drug and it, it wasn't very huge it was like 100k per patient but still it was like a strong debates and the bottom line of those debates as far as i remember was that um, fda agreed that uh, pharma is free to put any price tag on its drug otherwise it's not fair yeah, then we have some uh, other drugs here and uh, the one that I'd like to talk a little bit more about is Glivec. It has sales of $5 billion and actually, so I'm quite familiar with this drug. Do, do you know for what indication so what is the molecule? Not, not, uh, yeah. Okay, so the thing is that it's the first actually targeted uh, pill for oncology indication. It's an uh, inhibitor of BCR able and uh, uh, this molecule uh, actually is used for treatment of CML which is quite orphan indication so that's not a lot of people with this indication and it was really breakthrough drug because before advent of this Glivec all these patients they were just using chemotherapy and it was not very effective and it was very toxic and they had like a life expectancy of like few years but with the advent of this Glivec it was like they patients started to live a normal life so they had a life expectancy of 10 plus years and uh, it was a real uh, interesting story that was the first drug approved and it generated like a very decent sales afterwards so another interesting thing about pharma that makes companies uh, quite enthusiastic is a growing market and there are at least a couple of drivers of this growth so one driver is that actually life expectancy increases and there are more people that are that live up to the 50s 60s 70s and uh, 80s even and uh, for this group of people of course uh, some kind of special drugs are required some kind of uh, special diseases are required like aging population etc so it's a new market opportunity and also uh, of course uh, awareness of uh, like health status is becoming more and more important so that's a lot of people who care about their health who want to live longer who li want to live healthier and uh, it uh, represents another very important uh, opportunity Finally, as I've mentioned, uh, pharma is free to price uh, to price drug as they want, so they can put any price tag on their drug. And uh, so that's a list of top Rx prices, so prescription prices for the drug in FDA per patient per year. And actually, I think that it's a little bit outdated. So for now, as far as I know, the most expensive drug is. Uh, do you know what is it right now? What? Mm, not sure. Temozolomide, no, no, no. It's CAR T cells actually. It's CAR T cells that has been recently approved by Nowartis and by Gilead too independently. So it's about 700k per treatment. But it's uh, it should be curative actually. It's not like you need to dose it every year. It should be curative. But here it's like. And uh, this drug, Zoliris, is a drug for super orphan indication. It's a primary nocturnal hemoglobinuria. Sorry, and uh, it was priced like crazy, like 500,000k. Then it comes some other drugs, and here it's Prysel. And I can talk a little bit more about that because it's an, again a treatment for this indication as Glivec, so it's treatment for chronic neogenous leukemia. But it's a second generation treatment, and actually it's priced quite aggressively. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, basically that's all incentives that exist for pharma and these incentives are quite massive so that's why pharma is continue to put a lot of stakes in uh, development and also i uh, can talk a little bit about the current trends of pharma and i'll show it later on so the current trend in pharma as far as i can see it at least is that uh, pharma tries to um, kind of uh, move uh, shift uh, away from uh, early stage development so the goal is to acquire assets from outside it's not like we do a program from preclinical, from target discovery, lead optimization, etc. So a typical strategy now for pharma companies is to acquire early stage assets, not to do it in-house, just to minimize costs and to minimize uh, risks uh, which are connected with early stage drug development. Uh, so now if you talk about the perspective of uh, like entrepreneurs, of a scientist, uh, of biotech startup, 
there's a value creation chain in the biotech and it starts uh, typically with fundamental science with something like you do some researches you do something that is like how it's called uh, so you, you just uh, try to find something and you do not know if you will find it or not and that's basically uh, not something that can be funded by any investors because it's always a not that you will find nothing for example you are searching for a new target in some disease you can find a target and you cannot find a target so that's too risky and typically this stage of development is funded by governmental bodies and uh, some grants so it's like Skolko foundation grants ministry of science grants etc so it's a grant stage development then comes the discovery stage and therefore if you talk about like a uh, drug discovery it's a stage when you do have your target and you are kind of uh, developing leads you do uh, lead optimization medicinal chemistry etc it's a stage of discovery and at this stage indeed some uh, funding can come into the company in the form of investment in the form of equity investment so it can come either from angel investors or from venture capitalists so typically as for myself and as for RBV capital typically we do consider uh, projects uh, that do have at least uh, reached this stage discovery stage when the, com the company has some lead candidates and they have at least uh, high chances to get to and ready candidates later it comes to development stage and here development stage is so it's shown like a small stage but indeed it's very long it's like you do all your preclinical studies and preclinical studies can take a while actually it's not like so you know what's like formal regulatory studies you know what's the ND package so it's like you need to dose mice for like several months you need to dose dogs etc and it can go fast for a year or so or it can take a while if you do not have your final product and you do optimizations cycling back and forth and it can take really a while and at this stage it's typical stage for VCs to invest then it comes phase one phase two and phase three of course and uh, finally company comes to registration and sales and at this point so typically venture capitalists uh, do not participate a lot at least our fund because it's very capital intensive but uh, pharma companies typically can invest and afterwards when company is successful more or less it typically goes into public markets to attract uh, public funding and when at this point at least cash projections are quite clear for the company as for a uh, local perspective i can say that uh, of course first of all there are much few dollar signs here than there so that that quite that represents the situation quite realistically so we do not have a lot of funding in fundamental science that's a problem and also uh, we do not have a lot of funding for discovery stage and that's a problem as well so that's not a lot of so-called seed funds in russia i would say there are very few of seed funds and we uh, try not to position ourselves as a seed fund investor so but later if you talk about later stages uh, that's more or less uh, okay and more or less similar between russia and uh, global uh, so the question if you want to start a, if you're about to start a startup company a biotech company the question is where to get money and actually there are two principal sources of money which are very different one source is so-called soft money or grants and it's, it's basically non-dilutive funding so it's something that is given to you as a gift you need to just make some reports write some reporting and uh, you do not uh, give any stake in the company for this money that's why they're called non-dilutive and actually they can be attracted from different sources apparently they can be attracted from grant from Skolkova foundation and from other foundations so Skolkova is the most prominent in russia it can be attracted from ministry of education it can be attracted from ministry of industry uh, whatever uh, actually uh, the another source is the crowdfunding so i think that you know a little bit about this sources like indiegogo platform it's like kickstarter platform etc and typically these platforms some of them actually works uh, like you do invest your capital and you get some equity in the company but most of them works like you put one dollar and you you will have a t-shirt or the sample product when the company will be successful so it typically works like that and of course it's a uh, private charity foundations like bill and melinda gates foundation like foundations for specific diseases so uh, a lot of different orphan diseases has their own foundations which fund the uh, research in these areas so uh, if you speak about uh, this type of funding from your perspective it uh, has some good 
things and it has, uh, it has some bad things as well. So the bad news is that typically this funding is uh, granted without any validation of the market success of the product. So, you know, you can go to, I don't know, Ministry of Education and Science, say, and uh, apply for 100 plus 1 uh, COX inhibitor or 100 plus 1, uh, I don't know, pill for something, which is not new and which won't, will have a lot of troubles uh, getting some kind of sales. But, of course, Ministry of Education can approve this grant because they, they need to, like, develop something here. And uh, the same applies to all of these sources. That's a problem. And uh, actually, another problem is that all these investments are quite addictive. So that's a type of companies which uh, we internally call a uh, grant eater. And I don't know, it's uh, kind of uh, very widespread, but uh, yeah, we, we use the terminology. And it's uh, quite clear for us if the company comes to us and it seems and we see that the company has been living only supported by grants for 10 years. And it's uh, quite understandable. I mean, it's quite easy. You just supply grant application, get money, supply grant application, grant money, etc., etc. So you are not pressed at all. You do not need to enter the market. You do not need to develop. You can go very slow. And that's kind of relaxing. And also, of course, there are good things of this money. And uh, the good thing is that there is no control that you give out to somebody. And another very important thing that I'd like to mention again is that this is a slow money. It's not like you have a project and if you do not enter the market like tomorrow, uh, you will fail. And in that case, uh, you know, none of these funding sources will care about you. It's like they have their own timelines. They need to like uh, supply, they need to put this, uh, uh, say, put out these applications uh, in March. And then they will give some money and decide like in December. And during this period, you will just move slowly, do something, etc. So it's not like, you know, we do like you. As typical VC thinks, we give you money tomorrow and you will just bring the company public like in a couple of days from now. It's not like that. It will be very slow. And that's the problem. So another alternative is uh, dilutive funding. And that's something funding that uh, actually dilutes your own stake. And uh, indeed, you put somebody else into the company. To just get them in. Uh, typically, it's provided by uh, three sources of investments, but of course, it's not uh, an exhaustive list. So, it can be private individual investors or angel investors, as they are named, or you can see somewhere another term called high net worth individuals. This one, and it's a uh, there's some kind of threshold for these individuals in US, not in Russia, it's like a net income of 300k like uh, net wealth of 1 million, something like that. So it's typically persons who do want to invest their money into something interesting and risky. Another option is venture capital funds. And well, that's actually who we are in Serbia Capital. It's actually other companies like Polaris, Arch Ventures, Sequoia, etc. So that's a lot of venture capital funds globally. And not that much in Russia. And also it's pharma companies. So a lot of pharma do invest into early startups uh, and typically they try to get some kind of right of first uh, refusal or right of first negotiation. So if the startup will be successful, pharma has a, an option to uh, in license this asset on some preferable terms. Uh, so when you receive the funding, you need to understand that the final goal of each investor is not like to support the science or to like uh, support the society. It's like just to get their money back and get their money back with a good multiplier. So if you if we invest one bucks, we hope that we will get back five bucks from this company. And that's basically the logic. And uh, this logic actually dictates everything that uh, these investors do. So first of all, they definitely validate your approach. They validate like everything. Market, science, technology, IP position, team, team capabilities, development, and everything. So it's like very highly validated. And if your project is not good, it won't receive such funding, likely. Uh, the second uh, thing is that when you typically take such investment, you uh, get your investors on board. And that means that you are actually in the same board and you have uh, common goals. You have a goal to like bring your company to profitability. And that's good, almost always, because you have somebody who wants to reach the same target as you want. Uh, yeah, and of, of course you give out some kind of your stake and you give out some kind of control and sometimes 
it can not be appropriate for you as entrepreneur. And actually, we had a couple of cases where companies were not about taking our money because they wanted to be the sole owner of the business. Uh, yeah, so here basically it describes uh, what I've just talked about where venture capital is coming, but in terms of drug discovery stages. So as, as I've mentioned, we typically, uh, venture capital is typically ready to consider development stage from development to phase two stages. When we think about later stages like phase three, it's not uh, very common for venture capitalists to uh, invest into phase three studies. Reasons is that first of all, it's quite expensive. You know, like in order to conduct phase three, you need uh, sometimes hundred million dollars or even more. And second, it's typically not uh, very high risk. So I would say that the typical proof of concept is usually in phase two trials. And the phase two typically are designed to get some kind of statistical significance. And if drug is successful in phase two, then it's very high odds that it will be successful in phase three. So it's not a typical area of venture capital interest. So, of course, that's a lot of uh, like. Uh, pros and cons for venture capitalists to invest and uh, just from for the sake of time I can say that uh, the one very important con for venture capitalists to invest is that uh, there is a high risk of failure and there is no cash flow till exit so it's not like you can sell part of your company somewhere in the in-between so if you are running like a company from development to phase two trial there is no opportunity for venture capitalists to exit somewhere in between it's not like you can like sell something to somebody. It doesn't work. That's a very high risk. Uh, and another important thing that I'd like to mention here is that for venture capitalists, it's always like betting on 10 companies. And the typical situation is like, it's a more or less a random process. So it's like almost always, at least half of the portfolio companies will ultimately fail by some reason. But the thing is that at least one company which will be successful from the portfolio will pay off for all these failures, and that's uh, basically uh, the logic. So this slide, uh, I think it's, it's kind of a very uh, comprehensive and very concise. It describes how it typically goes from the idea stage, when entrepreneurs alone and owns the entire company, till like a stage with a co-founder. And at both the stages, I'd like to mention that the company value is almost zero, unfortunately. And then, Typically, it comes an angel investor who puts some money into the company and then company value grows up and then comes the VCs that put even more money and take some control and then company hopefully goes public. So, the most important things here is that, uh, uh, that I'd like to stress is that, uh, first of all, it's always a paradigm. Either you want investors, either you want to let somebody in your company or you do not want. But the thing is that it's better to own 10% of 1 billion companies than 100% of the company, which is zero. Another thing that I'd like to mention here is that uh, there's a very big difference between private funding and public funding. The thing is that private funding is more about matchmaking. It's like a club deals. It's like you need to like uh, look into thousands of opportunities. And no, it's not like it's listed somewhere, a list of companies that you can invest. No, you do like a very hard job going to conferences, talking with people, just searching for opportunities. It's not like that. But for public company, it's very easy. You just Google, you just hire a broker, you just buy stake in this company and buy shares in this company, and that's quite easy, and everybody can do that. So that's a big difference between these two situations. So these are some numbers about biotech investments. It's a little bit uh, maybe hard to comprehend in this uh, short talk, but um, I'd like to show you some kind of uh, interesting trends here. The first interesting trend is that uh, it's actually acquisitions uh, in biotech area and we can see that uh, this one is phase one acquisition, this one is the preclinical acquisition stage and this is phase two. And we can see a strong trend that while the total number of M&As remains the same, it's a strong trend for pharma companies to acquire earlier stage startups. And that's very interesting indeed. Uh, then, yeah, it's annual return, so it shows just that uh, return for investors for health industry is quite decent. And this one is also quite important for us to look at because it shows uh, mm, how venture capital uh, is, uh, separate, is uh, located geographically. And we can see that the most of venture capital comes to US. Then it's some in UK, some in Canada, and uh, very few venture capital everywhere else. And that's actually, actually, actually it reflects 
what do I know? So when you go to US, that's a lot of venture money, that's a lot of competition, etc. And you cannot find here Russia, unfortunately. Yeah, and uh, also, yes, it's more like uh, to show that uh, if we compare to other industries, uh, biotech, which is this one, this uh, circle, has a very short time to IPO compared to other companies and uh, quite a huge uh, number of opportunities that exited at this stage. So it's a chance to, it's a chance to early exit for investors. Now, uh, yeah, I think that I need to a little bit speed up. Uh, so now I wanted to talk about how venture capital works from the inside. What is it and what are the basic, what basically is the motivation of the venture capital fund? So venture capital fund works like uh, it has a general partner, which is actually not a person but a company, which manages fund. And also it has a limited partners. And limited partners are essentially investors of this venture capital fund. So they invest into venture capital fund, which in turn invests into portfolio companies and uh, actually general partner typically has some stake in venture fund as well and the incentive for general partner is that general partner typically has some uh, carried interest in the return of the fund so it's like uh, venture fund rocks operates and after say 10 years it returns its investment uh, with some kind of uh, premium to what was invested and then general partner will have some uh, percent of this return. So that's basically the motivation within the venture capital fund. Next, I wanted to put your attention to uh, typical venture deal terms about what is it about uh, how these uh, deals can be structured. And the thing is that for venture capitalists, uh, it's always very risky to enter early stage companies. It's like they invest their own money into the companies and uh, this company scale can fail at some point of time and therefore it's a document which is oops sorry which is named a term sheet which includes some control and economy matters which allows to protect the venture capitalists uh, from uh, some situations which can occur so if you speak about the economy part the basic part is price it's like you know we put one million into your startup and we believe that for this one million we will get a 10 percent stake in the company. That means that post money valuation will, will be 10 million and your startup company is worth 9 million at this point. So it's not something uh, defined. It's not like, you know, we have a table, we take a startup company, we put it into some calibration table and we say that it's worth that. No, it's not like that. It's always a matter of negotiation. It's like company says, we want a pre money valuation of 100 million, we say your pre money valuation is 1 million and then we try to come to some point of compromise. The second important uh, term here is the liquidation preference and the liquidation preference is very simple it's it's a right of an investor to get their investment prior to uh, founders if say we put 1 million into the company at valuation of 10 million dollars and the company is sold for 2 million unfortunately it's less than we expected but however we as an investor will get uh, 1 million back and the rest 1 million will be split between founders and the investors so that's called liquidation preference. There are very many different ways to implement it, but typically it's something that is uh, envisioned into the <coughs> term sheet. Then comes anti-dilution. So if we invest in the company and its valuation is like uh, $10 million, and then the next investor comes and says that, okay, I do not believe that it's 10 million. I will just evaluate it at 5 million. And we are okay with it. Then we do not uh, need to suffer from this. So the common, uh, shareholders will be diluted while venture capitalists won't be diluted. And it's anti dilution protection, basically. And finally, it's a pay to play provision. And this is a provision uh, for the benefit of uh, the founder. So it's something like, you know, you say that if venture capitalists don't want to participate in the next round of funding, he will convert into common shares. And conversion into common shares is a problem because you lose your liquidation preference, you lose your anti dilution, etc., etc. So that's something that is uh, sometimes uh, provided from the entrepreneur's side to protect themselves from uh, that the investor won't participate in the next rounds. And also that's a lot of different matters in terms of control. So it's like a board of directors seat that allows uh, VC to oversee the company's activity. Then it's a drag along provision. So if investor sells its stake in the company for some good valuation, then everybody must join. So it's like you see, uh, we have a 10% stake in the company and we 
we have found a good acquirer for this company and then we say okay we sell the whole company and the entrepreneur have to agree with us so that's that's how it basically it works then it's a list of protective provisions and uh, it's kind of typically a very long list and it's uh, introduced for entrepreneur to protect themselves from something uh, like not very friendly to them it's like company cannot out license its key ips it cannot uh, like um, go into some uh, negotiations without uh, VC approval etc so it's uh, uh, kind of a long list typically and finally it's a right of first refusal and it's a very important right as well so basically this is a right that uh, it's provisions that uh, venture capitalists have a right to uh, participate in the next rounds of funding at least to their prorata shares and that's something that is for venture capitalists of course so there are very many terms besides of this that I've listed here it's like a very long books about it very long lists but the thing that I'd like to clearly state to you is that terms are negotiable almost always it's always a matter of negotiation it's not like we see bring you a list of this terms term sheet and you need to agree no it's not like that it's like we see bring the list of term sheet you have your own terms in mind and then you come to some compromise it's always like that so talking about our fund about our structure so it's quite in line with what i've told you about the general structure and for us uh, rbv capital is a general partner our farm is our limited partner number one and the rvc russian venture company is our partner number two uh, we have uh, two million rubles it's rubble sorry this computer doesn't know that it's rubble two two billion rubles under management or about 35 million dollars under management uh, we have been uh, like founded in 2015 and that actually means that we need to return money to our investor within uh, 10 years from 2015 and uh, we typically put one to two million dollars in a single round and up to five million dollars in a single company so far we made uh, four investments this one is in us this one is in us this one is in russia and this one is in uk and we are actually looking for investments right now so we're expanding our portfolio that's something uh, about uh, our deal flow and that's to show you that uh, actually working in the venture capital is not an easy task it's not like you have an opportunity and then you typically just invest and that's it no it's not like that for the last year for 2017 we've uh, received about 1000 applications about 1000 presentations from different startup companies and out of this 1000 we regarded 300 because the rest 700 was not relevant for us by some reason out of this uh, 300 uh, 175 came to primary analysis and that means that uh, we let drive like dedicated about a couple of hours to study the matter then uh, about uh, 58 come to more detailed in review then the most detailed review was performed for 17 it's like we signed an nda and spent like uh, several days on that and finally it was only one deal that realized and that's basically that's it so you need to do a lot of work in order to close single deal that's how it works okay so now i can uh, talk a little bit uh, about our criteria and i think that these criteria are more or less similar for all funds so in order for the project to be investable we need to tick several boxes so the first and maybe the most important box is uh, a team so we need a strong dedicated team for the project to move on then we need uh, technology that is not something from the previous century we need a market opportunity of course because if it's no market it's no project for us then we need to have some kind of barrier to entry it's like you know if everybody can do the same then the company is not investable for us uh, we need to have a clear development path and it's always a problem it's like it's not like we put our money and we wait till something happens no it's like we put our money we do know where they'll bring the company to and that's basically our strategy and of course we need to have a reasonable investment terms but as i've mentioned this investment terms are negotiable so team is actually a key factor for success or failure of any project and the thing is that a good team can like uh, bring not very good some kind of average project to success but a bad team can ultimately fail a very good project and by saying that i'd like to uh, highlight that for us 
A good team means a team which is a combination of business and scientific background. Typically, purely scientific teams do not work very well, and purely business teams do not work very well as well. So it's kind of a mixture that we need. And the frequent uh, local problems in that are basically, first of all, that's quite few biotech entrepreneurs here in Russia. I would say that, I don't know, it's a very rare species here, <laughs> in other words, because most uh, researchers say that we do not want to engage into any entrepreneurial activity. It's something like uh, too risky for us, we do not want to do that, we do not want to play this game, we just want to do research. And, on the contrary, typical entrepreneurs just think that uh, science is something nerdy, I do not want to copy science, I just want to invest into some more real things, and uh, that's, that's the problem. And another very big problem is actually a lack of tech transfer culture in Russia. It's not related only to team, it's related to IP, to everything, but that's the second very big problem. So, science and technology. Uh, mm, sorry, how many time I have from now? Okay. Okay. So, then maybe I'll just speed up and say that from science and technology point of view, it's a mechanism of action that we always require for our investments, so it's not like we can in invest into something that works by some unclear mechanism. And the reason for that is that the risks of translation are very high in that case. If you know that the drug works in mouse for some reason, but we don't know for what the reason, and then we put it into human, that's a very high chance the drug won't work because we don't know the mechanism. That's a high chance that this pathway won't exist in human at all. That's a very big chance that affinity to the, to the human target will be different, etc. So it's not acceptable for us. Uh, yeah, and preclinical data is, of course, very important for us as well, but we keep in mind always that preclinical data is not the same as human data, and clinical data is ideal, of course. But typically it's a luxury for us to have clinical data available for the projects that we invest in because they're too early. Then it comes market and competition, and market is a very important thing here. Because, basically, if there is no market, there is no project. You do not want to invest in something that will be sold for, like, uh, one rubble somewhere. Uh, it's like a minimum program for us to look at the project. If the project has a totally addressable market of half a billion, that's something that we can work with. If it's, like, less than that, it's typically a problem for us. Second, if you talk to Russian projects, we do typically uh, uh, look into projects that can be interesting for global market because Russian market is only 2% of the global market. And you know, if you put 1 million into US company and that can address US market, and if you put the same 1 million into Russian company and that can address Russian market, that's a uh, well, very big difference for us. Uh, yeah, then. Uh, I can say that there are two classes of drugs, so I just classified it very roughly, but there are two classes of drugs which can be of interest for anybody and which uh, actually can be uh, lined up. So one is uh, general drugs for the general population, and these drugs uh, typically can have quite a huge market in terms of patients, but they do have a very high safety margins, and uh, they do require typically uh, quite uh, expensive clinical trials, because you need to show that your drug is safe for a very huge population. Uh, the typical examples of successful drugs in this category is a Lipitor. Do you know what is that? Lipitor, it's uh, basically a cholesterol-lowering drug. So I think it's a statin. It's a generated sales of 2 billion per year, and it's 5 million patients. That's huge. So do you know what's the population of US? 300, yes, 300. So basically it's uh, like uh, every 60 US patient receives that. Then it's humorous that I've mentioned already to you. And it's not very expensive, 25,000 only, but it's two and a half million patients. And it's pretty now. It's very cheap. It's like 500 bucks per year, but it's 7 million patients in the US. Do you know what is that, pretty now? No, it's a vaccine, actually. So every US uh, child receives it once a year. So that's why it's so huge success. And another group of drugs is so-called orphan drugs. So basically it's the drugs that are developed for small population of patients, less than 200,000 in the US. And these drugs are typically quite uh, often addressed by startups. Because you need a uh, kind of a small population of patients to show efficacy. You need uh, quite smaller safety margins because most orphan indications are very severe. And you can put a very huge price tag on your drug. 
because you have a small population. So here I can say that uh, it's salaries with a price of 500,000k per year and 5,000 patients only. Atypical with 300,000 per year and 20,000 patients. And basically, that's uh, still a very big market. But also I'd like to stress that indication slicing is not working. So indication slicing means that, you know, you make a drug and you say that this drug will be a, uh, applicable for patients with uh, chest pain and uh, with a pain in right hand. And apparently it will be like small population of patients. It doesn't work. So both options are viable, but both options have a very different development phase and require different expertise. Then it comes intellectual property or barrier to entry. And uh, uh, of course it needs, it's required first of all for you to uh, protect yourself from uh, competitors. It's very important. There are different ways of protecting your IP. It can be a trademark, can be trade secret, can be patent application, know-how, whatever it is. Uh, but still it gives you some period of market exclusivity. And it's not like you have a patent and that means that uh, you can not worry for like any time. No, it's like in 20 years your patent will expire and everybody can make a generic drug. And also important concept is uh, the difference between patent applications and know-how and trade secrets. So do you know what's the difference, basically? So the difference is that patent application is something that is publicly available. All patents are published. All patents are published. So that's important. It's not like you can hide your patent somewhere. No, it's published in every database. So uh, there's some uh, like uh, uh, exclusions like uh, provisional patents are not published typically, but other patents are published. And know-how is a completely different concept. It's like some know-how that has Coca-Cola, they claim, and some know-how that has other companies. They have some kind of secret how they do their product. And that secret is not known to the public. And that's the way of uh, creating a barrier to entry for you as well. But typically for biotech startups, a uh, strong barrier to entry is IP. And another important thing that I'd like to stress here is that if you have an issued patent, it does not protect you from claims of third parties. No. You can have an issued patent, you have your product on the market, but still some other companies can sue you because you are just using some kind of their patent protected materials. Uh, yeah, here's a little bit more about IP, but I think that uh, actually it's uh, not enough time to go through that. And uh, yeah, here I'd like to stress uh, a little bit more about development plan. So development plan is the next very important thing for us because it shows us how the project will emerge during the time. And uh, uh, typically it looks like that. So it's a timeline, it's development stages and it's money required. And for us it's very important because we understand that we put say $1 million and this $1 million will bring the company to that very inflection point. And if you put $10 million, then we will go to the exit. So basically that's how we think. And it's deal terms that I've mentioned to you previously and that are typically negotiable. So I'm Completely short? Okay, so maybe then I can uh, skip this case studies, which are very interesting and... But anyway, jump to conclusions immediately. <laughs> so the, the main conclusions that I'd like to bring to you here is that, first of all, uh, in order to bring a bench research to a product, you need uh, to put a lot of efforts. First of all, you need to put some money and it takes some time. So sometimes it can cost billion dollars sometimes it can be much cheaper but still it's an effort that needs to be made it's not like your research will automatically translate into that no uh, second is that uh, the venture investment if you talk about the venture investment it's not only the money that you get it's kind of you let somebody in your company and that somebody will also uh, govern the company together with you it's good and it's bad but it's something like a concept that you need to understand uh, next is like uh, that I'd like to mention is that the team is a very important thing, actually. So if there is no team, there is no product, and the good team can make any product successful. Yeah, and finally, I'd, I wanted to mention that it's not only a science that makes a project successful; it's a lot about execution that needs to be quite well performed. So finally, I would say that uh, actually, I hope that. Some of you at least will dec decide to select this path for your development. And uh, if you are still interested to even go over the startup and just go to Venture Capital Fund, you can also contact me because currently we are looking for some new folks to join our fund. So 
Thank you very much. And Thank you, Alexei. We have some time for questions. Thank you for the very interesting introduction to how it works in the uh, wild world of uh, investors. Uh, I have a kind of a general question. So uh, now uh, the society uh, pays for the basic research and then uh, depending on uh, what is successful, uh, the capitals uh, from either venture companies or big pharma, they enter to the projects which may give some uh, outcome, economical outcome for them. But uh, still, uh, as a result of that, new better drugs are developed and the companies, the pharma companies, they sell them for more to the society because they sell the better, so they would cost more to you. And uh, so this way the society uh, pays more and uh, it has less money left for the research. And then the research is getting more and more expensive every year. And then the society needs to put even more money to the research so that big pharma make more money by se selling better drugs. And obviously that won't be like that for the next 10, 20 years because, for example, already in the United States, the uh, FDA or some uh, ministries, they started to complain about super high prices for the uh, drugs which uh, big pharma sell. So what do you think will happen to this market? How it will develop? Yeah, thank you. That's actually a very interesting question and uh, I actually we do see this problem as well. So I believe that, uh, actually I hope that the situation will uh, remain the same status quo situation for the next two years at least because first of all so you say that it's a problematic situation but still you correctly mentioned that new drugs are continuously developed new and better drugs continuously developed and i think that that's a very important outcome first of all and second of course it's a way that uh, pharma can be limited in terms of pricing says like you can always say that you cannot sell this key you know, car t sells for five hundred thousand bucks it's too expensive you can just regulate it on the government level that you have to sell it for just for the cost you manufacture them. Or, so it's the worst case. Or the cost you spend for R&D and manufacturing them. It's a better case. But still, in that case, you know, pharma won't get any investment. Because they cannot cover their R&D costs. So they have a 20% margin that I've shown to you. But it's still not very big. It's like, because of a lot of spendings on drug development, like for and for drug, pharma have to put high price tags in order to uh, get the money back and get the money back for their investors. So I believe that uh, in the current uh, situation there is uh, no good solution to this problem, at least. I, I, I don't. I don't think that it will crash very soon. So apparently there will still be soon be a problem that there will be a reduced reimbursement for uh, orphan diseases, and that's something that seems to be correct but uh, still I do not think that it will be completely like drugs will become dirt cheap and pharma will do them for free I don't think that it will be something to happen I suggest that you use uh, the time for this question to tell us a little bit about uh, retrosense <laughs> okay good so retrosense is actually uh, one of successful cases from our portfolio and uh, it was, it was a company that developed uh, gene therapy for treatment of uh, orphan indication, or genes pigmentosa. So we invested into this company in uh, 2015, late 2015 when they were in preclinical stage. And in like 2016 they were acquired by Lergan after less than a year after they had some initial phase 1 clinical trial results. And the interesting thing about this company is that uh, I think that it was a combination of uh, drivers of the success for us. So the first driver of success was that it was a very high unmet need. You know, it's like a disease that needs pigmentosa, which has no approved drugs. It's like a vision loss disease. So if you do not treat it, you like you lose, you lose your vision. So it's something uh, severe. And because of that, a very marginal improvement will be highly appreciated by everybody. And that was actually done by Retrosense. So they've just demonstrated that their gene therapy uh, has uh, provided some kind of a very small site restoration. And it was immediate success. So that's the thing. Uh, 
Also, I, I'd like to say that it was not, it was very good science, but it was not uh, like a unique science. It was not like a Nobel Prize science. It was just a very well validated science. And of course, it was a very good execution by Sean and uh, by Ken and, and, and by the team of RetroSense. So they just did everything timely and they became just uh, ahead of all competitors because of that. Well, thank you for that. Uh, I, see, I see one more question. Um, I think I can't allow that. I'm sorry. Let's do that in person. Okay, let's thank Alexey again. Thank you.